Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You can be seated. It's a, listen, it's such a blessing to have um, you here tonight. And, you know, I look out over the folks that are here and, you know, most of you are from the abiding place and there's some people that are from the abiding place that aren't here tonight and I wish they were. But the bottom line of it is, I believe you're here because the Lord's put a hook in your jaw and He's uh, drawn you here to participate with what we're doing. Uh, really, the bottom line of it is, remnant is never big. And that's kind of, you know, a little challenging in, in many respects uh, for ministers and ministries. But I believe that remnant turns into something very, very big. I, I believe God for three million souls. See, this is my city. It belongs to me. 32 years ago, God gave me an assignment for this city. And uh, I'm happy to share it with anybody. And, you know, it's not like it's some, you know, grandiose, egocentric statement that it's my city. But it is my city. The Lord sent me here. He purposed me to do a work here in this place. And all I can see is three million people touched by the power of God. All I can see in my spirit, all I can see in my passions. These aren't grandiose ideas that I've set for myself. This is a divine agenda that I have a great intensity on the inside of me that pushes me every day towards this goal. To see more than 14 million people in Southern California encounter the glory and the beauty of the only begotten Son of the Father, Jesus Christ, the most wonderful person that has ever existed in the human race. Ha! And I, 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 I personally know the only one who can reveal him and make him known, and that person is the Holy Spirit. And one of the most important things that I desire to do is to demonstrate him. And to allow him to demonstrate himself through me. To let my life be everything that is under his divine inspiration. Somebody said to me, he said, you tell me about how this works. And I said, well, it works like this. Think about an artist, how that when you wake up in the morning, if you got this new thing going on inside of you, you got to paint. And, and only, until you paint or until you sculpt it, it's just on you and on my, it's just exploding on the inside. Or think about a poet or a songwriter the same. Well, when you live under the inspirations of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, it is so beautiful to be every day compelled to move forward into this wonderful divine commission that Father has for us. And I see you as being here tonight under the influence of the divine power of the Almighty God. And so, hey, come on, listen. I want you to be in expectation that God's not going to do something small with you He's going to do something great with you. One day I was agonizing and I said, Lord, am I setting the bar too high? Am I, am I, am I giving a general call to people that maybe really don't even have the capacity to, to be able to walk in this wonderful dimension of your glory and your power and your authority that you showed to us? And the Lord assured me that, yeah, within the human genome, within the human condition, that's true. There's a very few people who have the capacity to even really do much within the society of humanity. But when we step into a realm where we're baptized in His divine glory, suddenly the whole thing is changed. It's not about us and it's not about our capacity and our ability anymore. It's about the power of God and the working of that which only He can do. And all we got to do is stand back and enjoy it. So tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, you'll enjoy it. You'll sow your whole heart into tonight. Don't just give part of yourself to this. Don't sit there with, a, with a, an analytical mind evaluating the things that are said. It don't work that way. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, God is an emotional, touchy, filly, loves to kisses God. He is not interested in concepts. He's interested in infection, the love of the heart, the, the the joy of the heart. And tonight, let me just say to you, anybody in this place, and I can't imagine that there is a person like this, but I'm going to say it. I want you to understand, Father has peace for you, and peace is, is understood and comprehended in this. God has extended peace to you to where that 
you will have absolutely no condemnation, no sense of sin, no sense of otherness from him. His peace has invited us, those who are far away and those who are near, to come on in to the restricted zone of the holies of holies. Amen. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Everybody just smile and practice being happy for about 30 seconds. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then we'll let you relax. No, I'm just kidding. No, start and never stop in Jesus' name. Look, I don't know why the ushers haven't already passed out the uh, baskets and, and, and already got that going for you, but I want them to do that. What happens is they just get so captivated by the anointing, they forget everything that they were going to do. So they're going to pass out envelopes to you so that you can, you know, give privately and secretly, you know, to the Lord. <laughs> and generously and joyfully while you're doing it, you know, because what you do in secret, the Lord will reward it openly, you know. And um, so tonight, we just want, I want you to sow. Listen to me tell you what you're going to sow into. My daughter, Ruthiana, is getting ready to sing a, a fire song here in a minute. But uh, I want you to sow, I, wanna, I want you to hear what you're sowing into. Our nation must have a demonstration of the Holy Ghost conviction that turns the heart of men to a place of complete submission to the living God so that in repentance they would cry out and everything about their life be changed. The only way this is going to happen is somebody is going to have to get stirred up with an anointing to begin to go. And everybody that I know, including Pat, is saying, listen, we got to run with this thing in the United States of America because we're out of time. A dear friend of mine said not too long ago, he said, the time has passed, but I'm going to command the sun and the moon to stand still so that the day does not go, does not pass until we get this thing done here in the United States of America. Tonight, you might be five years old here tonight. You may be 10 years old. You may think that maybe that what we're talking about is a bit beyond your reach, but I'm going to tell you, God's stirring every heart here from 2 to 92 to grab a hold of a special function in His grace. You got one of two choices. I made a 10-year plan last year because I believe in goals. I made a 10-year plan last year to come into the fullness of the measure, the maturity of the ministry of Jesus unto a fully matured man. Their only other option that, that, that Peter, that, forgive me, that Paul gave in Ephesians chapter 4 was that you're going to be a child and you're constantly going to be tossed about by circumstances and situations and the whims of men. Not me. Come on, man. Listen, I'm praying everybody here tonight, I'm going to tell you, I want you to grab a hold of option A. You're, if you look at it and try to do it within the framework of your own human ability, you'll fail. But if you turn your heart over in a love relationship to the Lord Jesus, begin to admire Him, begin to believe of the greatness of His power that's been given to us, I'm going to tell you, He'll raise you up. And you're going to do exploits because that's what He said. In these last days, they that know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploits. And that's just the way it is. And people will try to confine you. They'll try to define you. They'll try to relegate you, to limit you. But you just step up into what God has called us into in a realm of the heavenly. He said, you see, you're here with me. You're seated with me here in this heavenly realm. Tonight we pray that you will sow everything into this. So what you're sowing into tonight is that message, that message, the message of calling a people to go all the way with God, to be what Elijah was, to be what Daniel was, to be, we'll go back, Enoch and Noah, to be what the Lord Jesus Christ is. <laughs> because our life is supposed to only be defined in Him. Paul defined this experience where we're it's over for us. We no longer exist. It's Jesus. To get that mentality, to grab a hold of that reality, to live out this faith. People, I'm telling you, this is life. This is unlimited life. It's a, it's, it's, it's a kind of life that there's no way to even describe it. You just got to be able to say it's abundant. It flows like the rivers. It flows with the expressions of God like rivers of living water. It's amazing how God described this undescribable thing that you and I can grab a hold of with our hearts tonight. And so I want you to sow. I want you to give. I, I, I'm believing, I believe what Reinhard Bunke is doing right now, it's mandated by God. 
friends of mine that are evangelists that have run only in the South Pacific or here or there, they're coming to America. They're saying, America is in peril. I'm hearing men of God. I'm talking aged men of God, great signs and wonders men of God who've been on assignment elsewhere said, America's in peril. America's in peril. And we've got to sow everything. And I want you to go and I want you to sow everything about your life tonight. I know there's so many of you have done it. Listen, I'm going to tell you what sanctification is in a very small sentence. It is to allow the Holy Spirit to live the life of Jesus Christ through you. It's being willing to allow the Holy Ghost to fully take hold of you so that Jesus will be all that is revealed. Sow your life to Him tonight. Sow your life to Him tonight. So your life, Father, I thank you right now that the finances and the money that has been given, the, the gifts and the offerings that have been given tonight as tokens of the surrendered and consecrated life. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for a miracle of multiplication. I thank you, Father, for a miracle of multiplication in the life of the giver. And I thank you, Father, for a miracle of multiplication in the life, oh God, of Pat and the whole team. I thank you for a miracle provision in the bucket right now and in the bank account too, both for the giver, hallelujah, and for the ministry in Jesus' name. Now, just before Pat comes to introduce a special guest that we have tonight, I'm so honored to have here tonight. I want, my, I want my baby here to sing a song and I want you to sing it with us because we believe that worship or singing Songs is prayer set to music. That's it. That's all we're doing. So I just want you to do this with us. She's going to, I want you to just sing the chorus a little bit, baby. And then when Pat feels that he's going to come up here and take over, okay?
you know, several years ago, I had this spiritual anomaly that kept happening. I kept seeing 9-11. Every time I walk past the clock, it still happens to me several times a week. Recently, when the Lord, I, I, I thought he was calling me back to the secret place. How many of you know you cannot live without the secret place? Psalms 91 verse 1. Because it went on, it began to happen to my staff. We kept seeing 9-11. Periodically, I'll just pull my phone out and, 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 turn, and immediately look, and it's 9-11 at that moment. So when we do that in my family, we all, somebody will be in the house, and they'll say it's 9-11. Our whole family prays because we want to stay in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But then the Lord showed me something, and I turned when I was beginning to study for, about the remnant. And Amos 9-11 says this, it speaks of the tabernacle. I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls. I will restore its ruins and rebuild it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. I believe that the remnant is rising across America. Can I read a couple of these to you just before I read our, uh, uh, we bring our guest up? You guys go ahead, just begin to play because I, I feel the presence of the Lord. How many of you stirred in your spirit across this place? Come on. Come on, do you feel that? Would you cry out to God for just a moment? Because we are, we are living in a very intense time. And I want to read some of these to you, and I want to see if you just shout a little bit. Because God is moving. The remnant doesn't bow to culture, but finds cultures recreated by their passion for Jesus. How many of you know we are turning the tide? We are pushing the wave. We are saying enough's enough. I had a dream recently of this darkness coming across America. And in my dream, I heard the Lord say, who will push it back? Who will say enough is enough? At the beginning of the summer, I had a dream of a tidal wave sweeping across America. And my wife and I were running from state to state to state. And I thought it was God judging America. And all day long, the next day after I had this dream, I kept saying, Lord, you promised three times you're not gonna destroy the earth with flood again, with water again. And finally, that afternoon, the Lord said, Pat, what you saw was my glory being poured out across this nation one last time. I shared that in Washington, D.C. because I saw it because we stopped at the Capitol and the water splashed up against the Capitol. Now, I want to say something to you because it can be very intense right now. We can watch what's happening with Ebola. Remember what I told you last night? Psalms 91 verse 10. No disease can afflict me. Nothing can harm me. You have to understand. In just a moment, you're going to be stirred in your heart. Romans 10, the Word of God is going to stir your faith. That's what's promised in Romans 10. But I want you to know something. There's a remnant standing in this area right here under God's ceiling. And God says, I'm going to pour out my glory. Let me read a couple more to you. Go ahead, Damien. Let me bring up some of those. The remnant has found freedom in the arms of a loving Savior who's not only forgiven their past, but also now has authority over their future. Give God a shout. Come on, go ahead. Remember I told you, God gave me these when I was writing the book and I was just praying one day and I was weeping before him in a track and he just began to speak these. And I wrote 34 down in about, about 45 minutes. But the remnant consists of those who feel like the failures, the fatherless, the forgotten, and the freedom fighters whose pedigree is that of a scarred savior. The remnant cannot be defined by man's concept because they find their value in the eyes of a savior. And the remnant doesn't stop where they should have died because they know that Jesus didn't. The remnant will not be swayed by the wind of compromise, will not stare into the eyes of revenge, will not seek the approval of the populace. That's who the remnant is throughout history. Cover to cover, God's word is remnant. Now watch. The remnant understands the fruit of the Spirit is not a salad for a church potluck, but rather the diet of a lifetime. The remnant includes the apostle with the worn out garments, the smiling prophet, the transparent pastor, the weeping missionary, the teacher with tools and hands, and the servant evangelist. The remnant says yes to the cross and no to the applause, yes to the altar, no to arrogance, and yes to covenant, no to worldly concepts. The remnant doesn't mind seclusion because they know its strength is found as their peace comes from secret encounters and private glances with the Heavenly Fathers. Do you, you do realize this is more than a spoken word. We are the remnant. Somebody give God a shout across this place. Sing that one more time. Just one more. Come on, let's sing and let's worship. Come on, sing that.
shout, give him a shout of praise. Cry out to him. No, come on, let's praise him. Let him hear it out there. Would you do something? Would you stretch your hands towards this building? Uh, stretch your hands towards that building right there. Because I think God's going to bring forth a permit for y'all to be able to meet in there and have services and going to shut down all this, this stuff that's stopping you from having your sanctuary in there and seating a thousand people. So let's pray. Father, we declare the doors will open. We declare no more red tape. We declare in Jesus' name, favor of God, that this building will be a dwelling place, a remnant, a tabernacle of David shall be restored in this building right here. We declare it. No more interruptions. Let it miraculously happen. Father, we declare in the next 30 days, supernatural keys be handed to that building so it can be open for God's people to dwell in. In Jesus' name. Come on, give him one more shout. High five somebody and you may be seated because you better get ready for God's word because it's about to happen. Thank you. Unbelievable job, worship team. Oh, my goodness. It was just, it was so pure. Hey, nine months from tonight, we're going back to New Mexico. And you've heard me tell the story that God showed me there'd be an outbreak on Route 66. I didn't know that God would bring everything together, that, that we would have the first remnant, the big one, this last summer uh, at Route 66. And nine months from tonight, we're having another one. Can I show you what happened this summer at Legacy Church in New Mexico? Because the pastor of that house is about to come and share. Would you watch this video? This was just what happened about two months ago. Watch this. San Diego because this is a well a place where God has poured out his glory before and I believe that this church is the backbone of what God is going to do in this city I believe that with all my heart and I want to say once again thank you for letting us be a part thank you for letting us come here we are so overwhelmed and honored and and uh, people are watching on the internet we're getting texts and tweets and all kinds of stuff from people that are saying that we're rocked last night and and in just a moment you're going to really be it's going to be pretty powerful but I invited someone that I believe that I'm called to walk in covenant relationship, much like I'm called to walk in relationship with Pastor Mark and Ann and all of you guys, because I've already asked Pastor Mark, you got to come and, and do, a, do a session at, at I Am Remnant. I just think God's going to use him. And don't, don't you agree that next summer in New Mexico, I think we need a caravan from San Diego. It's about 10 to 12 hours. Just, just go, right? You'll all fit in Pastor Mark's truck. Everybody just go. Just jump in the back. It'll be cool. And... Um, but I invited someone that I honor and I love dearly. And he's a pastor that runs, pastors a church of one of the largest churches in America. But when you meet him, he's just Steve. He's a man that carries a mantle because he knows that God raised him up. And he didn't have any help. It was all Jesus. And you got to hear from Stevie, uh, his son this morning, who's a general who God is raising up. How many of you got to hear that? Wasn't that powerful this morning? It's unbelievable. And uh, I'm going to use the shock collar thing again. I will use that again, and I'm give, not giving him any credit. But um, I want you to do something, Abiding Place, because this is probably the most, one of the most hospitable houses I've ever been a part of in my life. W would you, with just diligence and honor, would you stand to your feet and make welcome Pastor Steve Smotherman to the platform at your house? Come on, give it up. Hello. As you, as you stand, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we humbly come before you. Father, we come with grateful hearts and thankful hearts. Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit do a work in us, that we cannot spend time in the presence of God and leave the same. 
And I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for the word that's quick and alive and powerful and will quicken us. I thank you for the people that will be healed and set free. Revelation that will come to their minds and they'll say, it's like a light goes on. God, I got it. Thank you, Father, for blessing this house, abiding place. Thank you for blessing the pastors. Thank you, Father, that uh, you said if we acknowledge you in all our ways, you'd lead and direct our steps. So we acknowledge you in this place. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Well, you may be seated. I want to first say thank you to Pastor Mark and Pastor Ann and their family. They're so gracious. I, I, I came in today from Dallas, and I, I got to meet them, and I, I've, I've talked to them. And can I say this? Your pastors, they have great hearts, and they love you. They love this place. And, and I just want to take a moment to give honor to whom honors due for allowing us to come in and, and believe in, in Pat and, and, and what he's doing with I Am Remnant. And uh, can we just thank God for your pastors? Thank you. I want to I honor you guys. You know, I, I knew he was really smart, and he's got good hair. And uh, I'm not that smart, and I don't have good hair. And then he can sing, and I'm like, come on, God. What is, there's something not right here. He got all the gifts, and he, I, I don't understand, you know. But, but uh, and then I want to thank Pat Shastline. Listen, guys, this this I am remnant is, is you're, you're, what's going on around in our country. You, we're, we're starting to realize that if we don't stand up, uh, no one will. And, and I say this a lot. We don't need to stand up for God. We need to stand with God. Uh, God can stand up for himself. He's big God. He can do it. But we need to stand with him. You know, it's like going to a fight with someone that's big and bad. You, you don't really need to stand up for that guy. You just need to stand with him. And, and we need to stand with God. Because if we don't, we, we, we lose out and, and we miss out. And we need to understand that truth is, 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 is confrontational. We're inundated with the world. The, pulp, the world has a pulpit and it's called the media. And it's called all the things that go on with media. And they have a pulpit that, that, that begins to uh, teach us and, and, and lull us into darkness. And, and they call things right that we know are wrong. And, and truth in, in and of itself is confrontational. Anytime you teach the truth or God's word comes, it's confrontational. It confronts your life. And if we don't get that in our minds, we'll back off from it. And God wants us to understand that the truth is confrontational. And the world, uh, we, need to, we need to confront the world. We need to deal with it. We need to quit thinking about offending the world because the remnant people aren't worried about that. And we get so caught up with, Pastor, if I say this or if I say that, it might offend them. But the truth is offensive. The truth offended the people in the Bible. So much so that Jesus said, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, if you don't, you can't be a part of me. And thousands left him. I mean, you talk about rejection. Too many of us are on Facebook and Twitter, and I don't knock that. And we want everybody to push the like buttons. Push like, push like. And we can't handle it if they push dislike. And what we need to understand is that our need for acceptance sometimes causes us to not do and be who God wants us to be. God will bless us if we stand with him. If we do what his word says, it will come to fruition. It will, it will come to, into being that God can do something with us. And we need to confront this world. You know, one of the things I spend my time doing when I pastor and preach is I deal with the things of the culture. You hear this in the culture all the time. Don't judge me. You can't judge me. I even hear Christians say it. And when Christians say it, it makes me want to get sick. I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, pastor, don't judge me. I'm going to judge you. And you say, but pastor, no, the Bible says don't judge. Listen, when the Bible's talking there about don't judge, let's be judged. He said, listen, you deal with your sin before you deal with somebody else's sin. And listen, can I say this? I can't judge your heart. I don't know your heart. That's between you and God. You don't even know your own heart. People say, you, you know, but you don't know my heart. I know I don't care. I don't care about your heart because good intentions never got anything done. So I can judge your fruit. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. And so the fruit is the outside. You know, if you bought a tree, if you and I went and bought trees, you guys live in beautiful San Diego. I, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where brown is beautiful. Dirt is like, man, I love your dirt. Here it's come green, and, 
And, and when, you, when, you, when you start, if, if I was going to go buy some trees that were little and plant them in a yard and then take you to uh, the place I planted them, and I planted a peach tree and an apple tree and, let's say, a cherry tree, and I planted them, and they were real small. They were just put in the ground. And, I, and, and you and I went out and looked at them, and I said, hey, man, that's a peach tree, and that's an apple tree, and that's a cherry tree. And you would say, well, how do you know? How do you know they're so small? There's no fruit. We would know by the tag. It says on the tag, peach tree and apple tree and cherry tree. But after a while, we got to quit being known by the tag, the label, and we need to start being known by our fruit. So if I brought you back four years from now or five, you wouldn't even ask me. You'd say, hey, that's a peach tree. How do you know it's got peaches? So when the world says or people say, well, I'm a Christian, but you have no Christian fruit, then I'm only to come up with one thought and say, well, you're probably not really a Christian. Oh, but Pastor, how can you say that? Because if I say I'm one, I'm one. Well, I can tell you right now I'm an astronaut. Don't make me one. I'm an astronaut. I'm an astronaut. Pastor Mark, I'm an astronaut. You didn't know that. I'm an astronaut. And he'd go, well, when, when's the last time you went to space? I've never been to space. When have you been to NASA? I've never been to NASA, but I, that's who I am. And see, what the world does is try to get us thinking wrong so we don't deal with God, and we really don't deal with reality. So when people say, you can't judge me, I can't. I can judge your fruit. Don't tell me you're a Christian hanging out in places Christians aren't supposed to hang out. Don't tell me you're a Christian and you, and you, and you talk like the, the devil would talk. And, and so we, we need to start confronting the thinking and saying, you know what? I can judge your fruit. How, if I know you by your fruit, then I'll know what you're not by your fruit. And so many people want to use the term Christian. You know, if you take a poll in America, anytime you take a poll, 80% of the people will say they believe in God. The, we need to question, though, what God? What God do you believe in? What God are you believing in? Well, I just believe in God. Not good enough. Because Jesus said in John 8, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, he says, if you believe in the Father God, you will rely on me, you will trust on me, and you'll believe in me. If you don't believe in Jesus, you don't believe in our God. And then Jesus said, and I quote Jesus, Jesus went on to say, you're of your father the devil. Now, you know what? People say, well, you've got to be nice. I've never learned how to say that nice. I mean, you can try like, Okay, you, you're, you're of your father. That you're, you're of the devil. I mean, does it sound any nicer? It doesn't sound cool. It doesn't, and they say, well, you said that mean. I don't know how to say it nice. And Jesus made it very clear, you're either with him or you're not. See, we want to be, and I'm getting way ahead of my, I, I knew when I had to hold, see, I don't preach with this thing. I preach with like a lapel mic or something because I talk with my hand. So now I'm just going to preach. That's okay. I'm just going to, I, I, my notes are back here somewhere. And, but we, 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 we need to understand in Matthew 12, 30, Jesus said, and I quote Jesus again, he said, either you're with me or you're not. Either you, you gather with me or you scatter. And so Jesus begins to make it very clear throughout the word, either you're with him or you're not. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So when people say, I love God, but you don't keep his commandments, then I have to go by your fruit. And the fruit is, I don't know, man. Dude, I don't get it. I don't, I don't think you're with Jesus. Why? Because you're not bearing the fruit. Jesus basically said, and I love this word, and I'm using it a lot. I'm coining it, kind of. No in-betweeners. I want everybody to say no in-betweeners. There, you are not, you, there is no in-betweener with God. You're either with him or you're not. But, Pastor, that's not popular. I get it. Who said the message of the Lord Jesus Christ was ever going to be popular? In other words, if you really walk with Christ, some people aren't going to push your like buttons. But you know what? Jesus will. And folks, we really need to get a revelation and a reality that Jesus is real. And there's a real judgment coming. And, and we, we have purpose. God wants to, by his spirit, turn on some lights in us and realize that we, we have a right to deal with the culture and the things that happen. 
People use this one. Well, I'm a good person. I don't care. And, you, and that sounds cold, but I don't care. The, listen, and so what they do is they, they say they're a good person, so that, 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 that removes them from wrong or right. You have a whole culture out there when, we, when, you, when you start dealing with the homosexual movement. And, and so many people in churches get offended even if you say that word. And, and, and we've been inundated like, well, they're good people. I've never said they weren't good people. That's not relevant. That's not even part of the discussion. The discussion should be, is it right or is it wrong? But here's the fallback. But I'm a good person. So because I'm a good person, you can't judge me. You can't judge me because I'm a good person. You know, Jesus spoke to the good persons. He said it in Matthew 7. He said it in Luke 6. And here's what he said. I'm popping. Am, am I getting in front of the speakers? Or? Okay. See, I think God just showed up and is like telling us something. But Jesus even spoke to that mentality of being good. He says to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes and says, good master. And he said, there's only one good, and that's God. But we're, all, we're in a society where everybody says, but I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. No. Is this, is this, am I good now? And, and, so, and then in Matthew 7 and Luke 6, he begins to even talk about it more. And here's what he says. He says, in that day, men will come up to me telling me how good they are. And he basically says it like this. He'll say, they'll come strutting. The message, I love the message on this. He says, they'll come strutting up to me. Everybody knows what strut is? You, you strut. And he says, you'll come, they'll come strutting up to me, and they're going to say things like this. We bash the demons, and he's going to say, yes. We built buildings in your name, had everybody talking. And this is what he was going to say. He said, here's what I'm going to tell them. I have no clue who you are. But they did good things. You can't, you have to admit, when you, when you go back and read it, he did, they did good things. They weren't bad things. Bashing demons aren't bad things. I wonder if the demons would say, but I'm a good demon. Don't. <laughs> building buildings is not a bad thing. And we're praying that God releases your building. Because that's bad. I mean, that's just wrong. On every level. But, but, but so you see, and so God, Jesus even spoke to what the culture is dealing with today. I'm a good person. And Jesus said, guys, get this in your hearts. He says, I don't know you. you. Depart from me, ye the workers of iniquity, or depending on what translation, wickedness. You're sinners. I don't know. I've never had your heart. I've had your, your, your good deeds because you wanted to be puffed up, but I've never had you. And how does he know that? Because you didn't follow me. See, people of the remnant, the reason that my, myself and my son connected with Pat is because we really have a heart for the na that this nation. That we know if someone doesn't start confronting this world, they're lost forever to hell. There's going to be a lot of good people go to hell, and they're going to be shocked because they're going to say to God, but God, I did this, and I, I gave to charity, and I, I was nice to people. Here's another one that makes me kind of ill. I've never hurt anybody. I just live my life. I don't hurt people. And I'm thinking, well, how do you know? How do you really know if you ever hurt anybody? I've had people come up to me and, and say, five years ago, you did this or said this. You hurt me, but I forgive you. And, you know, you're kind of at a loss like, well, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> and, you know, you're gracious and say, well, whatever I did, I'm sorry. We don't know if we really hurt anybody. And then people who say that, but I, I don't hurt anybody. I just live in my life. But if you support like abortion, 57 million babies have been harmed. How do we know? See, we say these things and they get so cliche as we keep saying them till we start believing them. And then when you start really thinking about them, processing them, you're thinking, this doesn't make any sense. How do you know who you hurt? Listen, I've said things to my wife, did no bother her. And then the, one day goes by, two days, a week. I'm like, what's wrong with you? But you, when you said this, I'm like, oh, did I say that? I mean, women are like elephants, right? They don't ever forget. I don't mean that in a bad way. 
And I think, you know what, I hurt her. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to say something that hurt her, but it affected her. And we have to come to a place where we're not moved by the world because the remnant people are moved by what the world says. And they said, but what if you offend them? What if we offend them? My job, my responsibility as a believer is not to worry about if the world gets offended. My responsibility is to make sure I don't offend God. And when you tell the truth, because the truth in and of itself is offensive. It, it's confrontational. We have to get this word in our hearts. And I know your pastor is a great teacher of the word. We have to get it so in us that we want to be accepted by Christ more than the world and its ways and its systems. We have to start thinking through this process. And when people say, well, you don't know my heart, good intentions didn't get one thing done. Good intentions didn't put up these chairs. Good intentions didn't lead us in worship. They had to do something. And people want to be dealt with by their intentions because it's safe. It's safe. But we as Christians, remnant people, need to deal with what we, with the fruit. And if the fruit's not right, then we owe it to somebody to tell them the truth. Now, they may get mad, but at least they're able to make a decision. But if you lie to them, say, you're good people, you're right. Just live the way you want, do what you want. Then, folks, the problem with that is, is that everybody loses. They'll lose their life for eternity. They'll lose their life forever. You and I need to come and understand that God didn't fill us with his spirit so that we would be backward and and, and not have a say and not, not be bold for our faith. And I'm not talking about going to work tomorrow and jumping up on the tables and screaming Jesus. I'm just saying when, when, you, when you deal with things, you deal with it. You don't back off. You know, the Bible says in Romans 1, let me read it to you. He says in Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed out of the Amplified. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ. For it is God's power working unto salvation for deliverance from eternal death to everyone who believes with a personal trust and a confident surrender and firm reliance to the Jews first and also to the Greek and basically to everybody else. We're not to be ashamed. The word ashamed means feeling inferior, inadequate, or embarrassed, reluctant, feeling unworthy. It also means shame. Shame can be a negative, painful emotion that is a result of comparing one's actions with one's standards. So shame and sometimes is not bad. Have you ever done something wrong and felt bad about it? Anybody ever said, I have. I've, I've done things and I'm like, oh my gosh. And what happens is, is you, when you feel that shame, you're comparing yourself to your own standards and you violate them. So here's what happens in our world. There's a whole lot of people who agree that the word of God is God's word. But there's not a whole lot of people who believe it and there's a difference. And so what happens is when I agree with something, it doesn't necessarily make it my standard. So if I violate it, I'm okay. True believers are followers of Jesus Christ. The remnant people are true believers, not agreeers. And I can agree with something and, and, and say, yeah, I think that's okay. Like, listen, I agree with the speed limits, but I don't necessarily believe in them. So where I live, you can drive three hours and be in the middle of nowhere. And you're on a road, and the speed limit says 65, and you're the only one. It's the middle of the night. You're the only one out there. And so my question is, is the speed limit real when you're the only one there? So can I tell you something? I agree with them, but I'm just going to confess. Some of you might. I, but I, I would, I'm like, it, I'm the only one here. I'm going as fast as I want to go. Because it really doesn't violate. You say, but pastor, it's the law of the land. I know. I agree with it. But I don't necessarily believe in them. Because it doesn't take me two seconds. How many of y'all in here speeded before? Okay, so, I'm not, so I feel better now. I feel better. But you see what I'm saying? Because it, it's, and that's what a lot of people are doing. They're agreeing that this is right. But they're not really believing it. Because if I really believed it, I would never violate the speed limit. And what a lot of us are doing are agreeing that I know the Bible says that and I know the Bible says this, but you're not really believing it to the point that you do it. 
And then if you begin to do what you're not supposed to do, you're like, no. Nope. And then you start doing what you are supposed to do. Believing and agreeing is two different things. And we need to start believing something. For instance, I believe my name is Steve. I believe it. I, my parents told me that. My, they've called me Steve all my life. But if you walked up to me and said, man, you know what? You've been lied to. Your name's not Steve. It's John. Here's what, this is what's happening to us. And, and I'd look at you and say, man, dude, I, my name is Steve. No, you've been lied to. It's John. It's John. And then say it over again. Every time you see me, hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, John. I'm like, no, I'm Steve. I'm Steve. I'm Steve. Now, wouldn't it be dumb if you, if you saw this happening and then you walked up to me and said, hey, Steve. And I said, oh, no, my name's John. Because they said it so often that now I'm starting to fall into that. And then my parents get around me, and they call me Steve. And I said, no, 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 my name's John. And they're like, what are you saying? You are Steve. That's what I named you. It means crowned one. I tell my wife all the time, I'm like a, almost like a king. Treat me that way. <laughs> yeah, that's what she does. She just laughs like, yeah, right. But wouldn't it, it wouldn't make sense if you knew that my name was Stephen. After a while, I'm calling myself John. It wouldn't make sense. And, and that's what's happening to us as Christians sometimes. We're hearing something over and over again, and we start believing in things that make no sense. So if you come up to me and said your name's John, I'd laugh at you and say, back up. My name's Steve. You could never convince me my name's not Steve. That's the way we have to get the Word of God in our hearts to the point that no one can convince us it's not right. No matter how popular or unpopular or what people say, what the world says. Because here's the thing. It, 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 I don't know if you take notes here, but I always think that notes, uh, you know, the shortest pencil is better than the longest memory. And, and, and here's what's happening. The political correct crowd are not the same as the biblically correct crowd. Bib, uh, the, this political correctness, the way you got to say things and all that, is destroying our freedom of religion and freedom of speech. So I don't buy into it. They say you got to say gay. When I was growing up, gay meant happy. I say homosexual, and they say, well, that's not very politically correct. I don't care. I'm not trying to be politically correct. I'm trying to be biblically correct. Why? Because I want to see you have a life change. I'm not mean-spirited. I'm not angry. I'm not a hater. You know, they call us haters, and we, we've allowed, well, you're a hater. I've had Christians tell me, you're a hater. I said, dude, aren't you supposed to be a Christian? Yeah, you're calling me a hater? If you knew the truth and you really believed it and you walked in it, you would call me the most loving man out there because I'm willing to tell people the truth at, with the expense of not being able to push my like button. And that's the way we should live our Christian walk. We should walk with Christ in a way that, God, I, I just, I want to be accepted by you. I want to be pleasing to you. I'm not going to be ashamed of you. It wouldn't be some if my wife was here and, and, I, and, and, and I, I, I introduced myself and wouldn't introduce my wife. And she finally asked me, she said, Steve, why don't you introduce me? I said, well, baby, you know what? Be honest with you, I'm a, I'm a little ashamed of you. Yeah, it wouldn't go over very far. But wouldn't that be so hurtful? How many of y'all would think that'd be hurtful? That'd be wrong. You know what? What do we think it is when we get around our friends and the world and we want to be like them? We want them to like us, and yet God is with us the whole time, saying, if you'll just introduce me, then I have a chance or a way maybe I can get to their hearts. But we say, no, I'm ashamed. I'm not ashamed of who saved my life. I'm not ashamed of who gave me a life. In fact, I stand here very grateful and thankful for, for what God's given me. I'm so incredibly thankful. I never take it for granted. I'm so appreciative that God gave me a life. He gave me direction. And folks, I need to say this to somebody here. I haven't always been a pastor or a preacher. I worked for UPS for 10 and a half years. This is going to help. I don't know who you are. It's going to help you. Say, oh, yeah, it's easy for you to say. You're, you stand and you preach. Listen, I worked at UPS as a package car driver for 10 and a half years. What can Brown do for you? I was that guy. I delivered packages for 10 and a half years. That's one of the places God trained me to do what I'm doing today. And can I tell you this? When I was at UPS, they had lesbians working there. They had guys that were just kind of, you know, just, out, just living in the world. And can I tell you, I, I always stood with God. 
And it was so funny, the people who kind of came after me and mocked me, in fact, you know, at, at UPS we, we, in, in, in Oklahoma, there was a union, and union and management hate each other. I don't know why, but they did. Well, I didn't hate management. I didn't hate them. If I didn't like them, it's because they're sorry. I didn't dislike them because they were management. And there's a natural strife that goes there. And, and so because I would work with management or I would, you know, I was nice to them, I would come in in, in the morning because you couldn't, you couldn't come to the UPS dressed. You could wear your shirt, but you couldn't wear your shorts or your pants. You had to get dressed there. They didn't want you leaving fully dressed or, or, or coming fully dressed. So I would go up there, and there'd be notes on my locker saying the most awful things. Now, I was young, so I wasn't always bearing good fruit. And I would look at those notes, and they would say some bad words. You sorry, blank, blank. And I would look in the locker room be full, and I would say, who wrote this? And I'd look around the locker room because I was dumb. And I'd look around and say, who wrote this? You coward. You chump. Who wrote this? Just because I was going to fight them. <laughs> so I, so I, I still, I was a work in progress. And, 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 and they used, and, and you know what? I still, I, I, no matter what they said, I still did what God wanted me to do. Can I tell you, when I was at UPS, I, I remember going to a, a lady's door one day and and she says, this is what began to really humble my heart. She says to me, she gets in a conversation, and she has this little business, and I was th there all the time delivering packages. Her daughter had, I, I don't know if it's cerebral palsy, but where her legs didn't grow out, and so she was in a wheelchair. And, and one day I'm talking to the lady, and she finds out I'm a Christian, and she starts just telling me her life. I'm, and I used to be mad at God saying, I'm only the UPS man. And this woman began to pour out her life, and she said, I've had cancer. And then she even pulled back her, she wore a scarf and she pulled it back and she showed me the scars all over her, bad looking scars where she'd been cut on. And she began to talk to me about God and the Word of God. And, and I'll never forget this, guys. And I, I want you to understand this, the spirit of I'm coming, the spirit of Pat and Stevie and Damien and the whole remnant movement is not a message of hurt and harm. It's a message of compassion and love. And she began to tell me her whole story. I'm the UPS guy. And I used to say, God, God, I just want to deliver packages. I don't know why she's telling me her life. I don't want to know. And she showed me and she talked to me. And we, I talked to her and her husband a lot. And then I started coming and I started ministering to her. And I said, you know, I believe God can heal you. And so I brought her healing tapes and healing scriptures and, and man, they would meet me at the door, her daughter, her, her son, her husband. They would meet me at the door when I show up. I'm just the UPS guy. And then she said this to me one day. She, was, she came to the door by herself and she said, I have to talk to you. I'm the UPS guy. And she says to me, she says, I want you to know something. If I ever get cancer again, I just want to go home because I can't live with the fear any longer. If I ever get it again. I want you to know that. And I'm thinking, why are you telling me this? I'm the UPS guy. See, it doesn't matter what you do in life. You're still God's person. And you may be the only person that can minister to that individual. Long before they get to the preacher of the church, it could just be you. But if you're afraid, if you're ashamed of Christ that saved your life, you'll never be whatever God wants. You'll never, you'll never reach the potential You'll never uh, come into the promises that God has because God says, be a servant no matter where you're at. Paul was a servant in prison. Daniel was a servant in captivity. He says, you're, you're supposed to be a servant no matter where you're at. And so she began to tell me the story. And then one day I get a call from her husband. I'm at home. And she said, hey, Steve. He said, hey, Steve. And I said, yes, sir. I'm at home. It's a weekend. He said, can you come to the hospital? My wife's in the hospital. And I'm like, well, why do you want me to come to the hospital? She's requesting you. I'm not the pastor. I'm the UPS guy. So I'll never forget, and it breaks my heart every time I think about it and tell it. I went to the hospital, and I go up, and she's looking at me. Now, remember, she said this to me. If I ever get cancer again, I just want to go home. And in our conversations, she talked a lot about, is, is heaven real? She believed in God, but she said, is there really a heaven? And I remember telling her over and over again, there's a real heaven. There's a real heaven. And I remember I went up there, and she looked at me. She had this look on her face, and I'll never forget it. 
because I walked in, and because I really wasn't, I didn't own enough of myself, because I, I thought I had to be something that, that, that I didn't need to be. I, I'll never forget, I walked in, and I looked at her, and, he, and her husband left the room. It was just me and her, and I prayed that God would heal her. And I remember walking out of the room when I looked around, and tears were coming down her face. She didn't want to be healed. You know what she wanted? She wanted a believer to tell her it was okay to go home. And I think sometimes we miss what God can do in our lives. I remember I went to my car, and I, I, I sat there, and it dawned on me what happened, and I cried. And I said, oh, God, I will never, ever be that arrogant again. I will never, ever come to a place where I just can't be loving and kind and honest and truthful because you're so truthful. All she wanted was somebody, not the pastor, not some preacher, the UPS guy, to say, go ahead, it's okay to go home. She died a few days later. And I said to myself, I'll never be that guy again. I'll never be ashamed of Christ. I'll never think I know it all, but I'll never be offended with the gospel of Christ. I will come in and I'll be just loving and kind and gracious. But here's the deal. We have to be truthful. Now, I said that. It's not anywhere in my notes for someone sitting here that thinks this is okay if you're just a preacher. But folks, this is a message for all of us. You don't know who you could affect. When I left UPS, when I resigned and left to go pastor in Roswell, America, I'll never forget the guys that criticized me and ragged me. They literally walked up to me one after another and said, what are we going to do now, man? The preacher's leaving. You're the preacher of the place. I, I didn't know. I didn't know they thought of me that way because they made fun of me they, because I worked hard. And they said, what are we going to do now, Smotherman? You're the preacher. You're the one that keeps us safe. Who would have ever thought? Even the ladies that were lesbians, I wasn't mean to them. They even come and said, man, I can't believe you're leaving. Because somebody, somebody needs hope. And we serve the hope of glory. And if you don't give somebody hope, who is? That's what the remnant is. That's why you're here. That's why we come. That's why I believe your pastor let us come. You are somebody's hope, but you're not that hope if you're not truthful. If you don't believe enough in the truth, if you don't honor God's word and say, I believe. I'm not an agreer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer of hope. I'm a believer you can be something different. I'm a believer that you can change. I believe. And you know what's great? God believes. God believed in me when I was young and got saved. He said, you can be something. I didn't believe I could be something. He believed. It was a long time before I believed I could do anything for Christ. But you know what I loved? God kept giving me the truth. He kept putting me under pastors that would give me the truth. And that truth finally got in. And I realized that, you know what? The truth is what sets us free. Not deception, not lies, not good intentions. Folks, when you go to your work, when you go to talk to anybody, you need to realize, wherever you go in life, the truth is what's best. Spoken in love and kindness, but it's still truth. And when people start going through all these things, you think you're holier than thou, just say, yes, I do. You think you're so righteous? I am righteous. Just own it. And when they say, well, you're judgmental, no, not really. But then again, I am. I'm judging your fruit. And if you're not careful, the way you're living will take you to eternal death. And guys, we don't want people to die and go to hell. Can I tell you this? There's people I don't like on the earth. I don't care if I ever see them. I don't like them. But I don't want to see them go to hell. People, if we truly love, quit listening to what the world says is love. They tell you love is agreeing with everything. Love is not agreeing with everything. Love is telling people, being willing to tell people the truth. The people of remnant, I am remnant. The people of remnant are the ones who aren't ashamed to tell people the truth. To love them enough to be honest, not mean. Not, not, not just critical, but honest. If you don't change your life according to the Word of God, you won't inherit eternal life. Because there's no such thing as an in-betweener. Either you're with Christ or you're not. In fact, Jesus says like this, either you serve Him or the devil. 
People would say, you mean you're telling me I'm serving the devil? Yes. Because you're not serving my father. Because if you serve my father, you'd believe in Jesus. And if you believe in Jesus, you'd follow him. See, there's too many atheists in the church. Whatever area that you are unwilling to do of the Bible, you're an atheist. So if you're not a tither, I believe in tithing. I believe every Christian should tithe. I believe in the fundamentals of Christianity, that new Christians should come to church all the time. They should tithe and they should serve. And people say, well, that's the all in all. No, that's the beginning. Because then you've got to get God work on you, right? And so if you don't believe in tithing and giving to the church, then, then here's, I love this term. I heard it and I love it. I'm owning it now. Then you're a financial atheist. Because you've taken part of the scriptures and said, I don't believe. What are atheists? They don't believe in God. If you don't believe you should help anybody and serve people, then, then, then you're atheistic in your, in your attitude. It, it's, 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 see, whatever you don't believe, whatever you're not willing to believe of the scriptures, whatever you're willing to remove, says now, God, I don't believe in you. And whatever part of God you remove, you remove God. Because there's no in-between. Everybody say, no in-betweeners. No in-betweeners. You're either with them or you're not. How do I know if I'm with them? Are you following him? Are you doing what he asked you to do? And yes, we'll all make mistakes, and I close with these thoughts. We're going to all make mistakes. We're going to all blow it. Thank God for 1 John 1, 9. that says, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about being willing. I'm talking about being unashamed of Christ. I'm talking about being remnant. I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, we, 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 we want to be part of something that pleases God. I'm talking about allowing God to come in your heart and heal you. Some of you have been hurt. Some of you deal with pain every day. I'm talking about true repentance. And can I say this about repentance? Repentance is not saying I'm sorry. That just means you're sorry. I tell my wife sometimes I'm sorry. But I, I say it with an attitude. I'm sorry. All right, I'm sorry. That's not repentance because I don't plan on changing. That means I just got caught. She confronted me. I don't want to argue or deal with her. So I'm like, I'm sorry. And my wife's a queen. Let me tell you, she treats me so well. She does everything for me. So I'm, I'm, but, 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 but there's repentance. Repentance means I've changed my mind. I've changed my thinking. I went, I said, I used to go this way, now I'm going this way. And so if you are here and you say, you know what? There's areas in my life that I've exempt myself from. I've excused myself from doing. I've said God understands. Can I tell you that's another lie? Well, people say this to me all the time. I'm a pastor. They say, well, preacher, God understands why I don't do this. God understands why I don't tithe. And I'm like, really? Tell me why he understands that. Well, he understands I have a car payment, I have a house payment. I say, get a smaller house, get a lesser car, because God never excuses you from doing what he asks. See, we, don't, we want to live a life with no sacrifice. Well, Pastor, the reason I don't serve is because I'm busy. Well, we're all busy. But if we serve others, we'll be healthier. There's just something about it. There's just something about it. There's just something about that happens on the inside of us when we, when we give ourselves. You know, they say if you use a lot of personal pronouns in your life, like you just talk about I, me, I, me, I, me. If you talk like that all the time, do you know your chances of heart disease goes up a, a, a ton? Seriously. If you if you always talking about you, your chances of getting heart disease is, is greater. I forget the percentage, but it's like a, a high percentage than if you talk about someone else. Or if you help someone else, we have to decide who we are. I said that about repentance because I want to close with this. If you're here and there's areas in your life you know you've held back from God that you're not doing, that you know. Because here's what I believe. The whole time I'm talking, the Spirit of God was dealing with some of us. And can I say this? And dealing with attitudes. Dealing with attitudes. Because even some of the things I said can create an attitude in you because here's what we do as people. We relate it back to our family. Well, pastor, don't say homosexual is wrong because my cousin, my brother, my sister. Just because, listen, my brother, my oldest brother was a heroin addict and an alcoholic. 
Not a bad guy. Sometimes he was. But he was wrong. It didn't make it right just because he was doing it. My brother just older than me was a speed freak. He got busted two or three times. He got a five-year suspended sentence and a ten-year suspended sentence for dealing drugs. Was he a bad guy? No. But what he did was wrong. We have to own enough of ourselves and believe in God to say, it doesn't matter who they are, wrong is wrong and right is right. If you are here and there's areas in your life that you're willing to change your mind on, here's what I believe is going to happen. When, you do, when, when this happens, I believe God's going to heal you. I believe some of you are going to get free. Your, your mind's going to be open. Your eye, the, 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 the enemy, the God of this world that blinds our eyes, is going to be lifted and you're going to be able to see clearer. And you're going to recognize this. God is the healer. He is the lover. He is the one that helps me and delivers me and sets me free. And he's real. If there's areas in your life that you say, you know, God, and this is not about being prideful of who you are because we all have them. There's things that we know that we haven't been doing that we can repent from. And again, repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. It's, it's really saying, I, I, God, I repent. I am sorry, but I'm sorry. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to change. I'm going to quit going this way and start doing what's right. Because that's what repentance is. Can I tell you this? Until you have true repentance. I think it's Luke 13, 3 that says that you, you have to repent. Those that repent that will have eternal life. Those that don't repent won't have eternal life. It's not just saying, God, I'm sorry and going doing what you want. It's repenting, saying, God, I'm so sorry. I'm willing to change. Give me the strength and the courage. If that's you right now, you're going to begin to play as he plays. Josh plays. I, I, I want you to begin to come. You can stand. You can kneel. You can, you can lean on the pulpit. You can lean here. I'll back up. Because I, I want God to do something. If we're going to be remnant... Let's be real. If we're going to be Christian, let's be real Christians. When I was in the world, no one, had, no one ever questioned and said, I think you're a Christian. When I was out partying and doing my thing in college, no one ever accused me of being a Christian. Nobody said, man, Smullman, I think you're a Christian. No one ever said that. But here's what, I, what happened. That when you become a Christian, people shouldn't accuse you of being just like them in the world. It's got to be something different about us. It's got to be a change. There's got to be that. And it all starts in your hearts and minds. As he's playing and singing, if you want to come, we're just going to let the Spirit of God deal with your heart. I'm going to turn over to Pastor Mark. I see him coming. And, and I want you to really, this is your moment to cry out to God. Not in a way that, that, that just doing it to doing it, but in a way that says, God, there's some areas in me that I know I need to get right. There's some things I gotta let go of. There's some changed minds. I gotta, I gotta begin to do this and stop doing that. And for some of you, if you humble yourself, you'll be delivered. Because I believe where the Spirit of the God is, there's freedom. And I believe the Spirit of God's here to free us, to help us. Some of you young ladies in here that have been abused, God's gonna heal your hearts. Some of you men in here that have been hurt and abused, neglected, rejected, abandoned. Jesus said, I'll never reject you or abandon you. He says, I'll never forsake you. But I, I like to say it, rejection or abandonment because some of us have that in our hearts and we don't even realize it's a thing that's hindering us. It's not that you don't love God. It's just there's always a barrier there that I, I can't seem to get over. So right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, I thank you as you deal with hearts and minds and they come. I'm asking that you deal with their hearts. I'm asking, Father, that you minister to them as we just humble ourselves before you and say, God, I, I, I repent. I want truth. I want to do it right. I want to bear the fruit I'm supposed to be bearing that I, I know is, is wilting on the vine, but it should be flourishing on the vine. Father, you deal with hearts and minds, and guys, it's open if you want to come and pray. standing in your presence in the presence of my God 
Who I am standing in your presence, in the presence of my God. And I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord, to your I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord, to your will. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord, to your will. I say yes, yes. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes to you and all you want to do in me, Lord. I say yes, yes. I say yes, yes. I say yes to you and all you want to do through me, Lord. I say yes. yes. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes to you and all you want to do in me. Lord, I say yes. Lord, I say yes. Lord, I say yes to you. Oh, I say yes. Now here's what's happening. There is a moment where confrontation begins to tear you away from mindset. I posted something today, man. I've been just getting eaten alive all day on Facebook. It's been crazy. I love it because the church has been quiet for too long. And while we've been playing nice, the enemy is being playing bad. Pastor Steve, just a moment ago, drew a dividing line in the sand. And the Lord, I was down here praying, and the Lord said, you go up and tell them if you're willing to make the stand to cross the line and say, God, I will be your voice of truth, then you need to understand, just as we've seen in the encounters, there's going to come a moment where I honestly believe it's, I don't know if you've ever seen like Transformers, but this is what I kind of saw. Where all of a sudden, like, this armor starts just buckling around you. Or Iron Man, some goofy movie like that. Where all of a sudden, God begins to put around you His armor, His glory, and His light. And God says, I'm looking for a people that will come and stand firm. In a moment, Pastor Steve, I'm going to ask him because he's very gifted at leading people into the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I'm asking you right now, if you say, Pat, you know what? I've had enough. I'm ready to make a stand. I'm ready to be desperate for God. I'm ready to walk in the, in the Spirit. I love what he, when he read out of Romans chapter 1. I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power thereof. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're desperate for God to use you, I believe as you begin to walk towards the very front in just a moment, the Spirit of God is going to overwhelm you. And you're going to begin to stand. You're going to be taller. Remember when Jesus walked up to the girl that had been bent over for 18 years? And he said, you got an infirmity on you that has kept you bent over for 18 years. There is a moment where you got to quit being like this. And you got to stand up. And you got to say, I will make a stand. I will be desperate for God. I'll be the one that if I'm a fool, I'm a fool for God. I'll be God's fool. I'll be desperate for him. And I'm telling you, I personally am at this crossroads where God's saying, you really want this, Pat? You really want to go into the nations? You really want to pay the price? Because I'm calling you to do it. And if you are desperate for God and you say, I will make a stand, walk down now. Are you ready? Let's go. All over this place. I'm talking about holy desperation. As you walk down, lift your hands and begin to cry out to God. Because God says, I'm looking for a people that are hungry enough to say, yeah, I'll be the remnant. It's real easy to wear an armband. But it's way deeper than that. And that's what we just heard tonight. It is so much deeper than wearing an armband. It's about saying, I will flow in the gifts of God. 
I will be the one. Cry out to God and say, I will. I will. Draw a line in the sand. I can't go back. Now say, Holy Spirit, fall upon me. Empower me. I repent because this day I'm not a part of this world. I belong to the kingdom of God. Now begin to pray and cry out to him across this room, across this area. Because God says, I'm looking for a people that will be desperate enough. Come on. We've got to get turned on for the lost again. We've got to say, God, I want you more than opinions. I will, I will pastor my workplace. I will pastor my neighborhood. I'll be the ones that when I walk out of the room, they know light just left. Listen to what the Bible says. And this is what I was trying to get you. Listen to what Jesus said. This is the words of Jesus. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, change your mind for the better and hardly amend your ways with abhorrence of your past sins. You will all likewise perish and be lost eternally. There's so many people that, that, we, that, that come to Christ and we, we, we don't really give them our whole life. And I think that's what I was trying to say. And I think that's what God is saying. For some of you, it's hindering what God wants to do in your life. Folks, and then in a moment, we're going to pray. How many of you in here are, are filled with the Holy Spirit but don't have your prayer language? Anybody? Anybody in here? Does, does everybody in here speak in tongues? Everybody does. But man, Pastor, you're the man. <laughs> but you know what, guys? If, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we say, God, I'll judge myself, then he won't ever judge us. And, you know, people just want to just, God wants to just really touch your hearts so you can be what Pat just said. We can cross the line. And I love what he said, Pastor, where you, where you work. It's about being a servant. It's about wherever you're at to serve Christ. But the best time to do it is when God heals our hearts. I, I need to find out, what is your name? What is your name? Yes. What is it? Come here, Christiana. Christiana? Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up this young lady to you, and I thank you so much. I thank you, Father, that you just bless her. I have no idea who she is, but God, you do. So, Father, I thank you that Christiana, she, Christiana, right? She has a, a kind heart. She really does. But, Father, in all of us is a search. We're searching, and sometimes she searches, and sometimes she, she, she says, I know this is what it is, and this is right. But, Christiana, sometimes it's like, I know, but, but, but the, the, the thing about acceptance is we don't like to be disliked. And sometimes that hurts so bad. Sometimes it's painful. And sometimes we think it's just better just to go this way than, than the other way. See, here's the thing. You know who God is. But sometimes just staying with him is tough. It's not that you don't like him or love him. And you, you search. You're a searcher. I, I, I need you to understand. You're searching. God doesn't dislike you. He's not mad at you. He loves you. He truly thinks you're okay. He truly does. And we all do things. We all make mistakes. That's why you walked up here. Because you know. And, and you think, and we think so little of ourselves. And God doesn't ever want you to think little of yourself. And sometimes we do things just to fit in. Sometimes we do things to be noticed because we haven't been noticed. Sometimes we think we're something that we're not. We think we're, you know, never pretty enough or never good enough. And God, if you really love me, why would this happen and why would that happen? Does any of this make sense to you? And here's what God's saying to you. He's telling you he was always there. He's never left you. He's not angry with you. He wants you to know that out of this whole group of people, and I know nobody, he picked you out just so you know. And here's what you need to hear, that you are special. I need you to know that. You don't have to feel it. You don't have to be trying to be something. Because really inside you, you're going to be allowed the enemy to take you in a direction that you know what's it is. You know what? Here's what it is. Well, Pastor Steve God ministers. 
remnant line up across this area. I want the leaders that have been a part of this, setting this whole vision up. I want uh, Elizabeth, if she's here, and you know what? I want you to come help me. I feel the Holy Spirit saying we're supposed to lay hands on people because you're going to be endued with power tonight. Now listen to me. God wants to baptize. There was a couple of hands that went up that have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. If that is you, shake your hand at me right now. You say, I want a prayer language. I see a hand right back there. That's, I'm so proud of you for doing that. Raise your, keep both, shake your hands at me. You ready? Here's what happens. I'll do what Pastor Steve, because he's ministering for a moment. But across the front, those that are in the leadership team, spread out across the front. I need Jordan. I need, I need my team. I need everybody that's here with me to get up here now and get ready, because God's about to move. We're about to lay hands on people. We're about to minister life to people across this room. I believe... Paul said, I wish I could lay hands on everybody. That's what he said. He said, man, because there's something so supernatural. You know what the Lord showed me? Now look at me for a second. Hold on, listen. So the Lord showed me this the other day. In Isaiah, it says he put our name on his hand. God's into tattoos. He's like totally got your name on his hand right there. Okay? But then it says in Revelation that his name, there's going to come a moment where God's name is engraved on our forehead. That's what the Bible says. We'll be known by that. You know what that tells me when we do the laying on of hands? Because that means my name touches his name. That's what happens. When we begin to lay hands on you, it's the hand of God laying hands on you, and there's a communion that takes place. And there's an anointing that begins to pour out. That's why he said he anointeth my head. Are you with me so far? So we're going to pray for you, and I believe that God's going to do you with power. But all over this room, look at me for a second. I'm going to teach you something really, really, really quick. Nine times in the, nine, turn this up for me. I don't know if you can. Nine times in the book of Acts, it talks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul even said it 20 years after the day of Pentecost. said that God will give you a language between you and God. Are you with me so far? 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 talks about speaking in other tongues. Why do I pray in other tongues? Because when I don't know what to pray, my spirit makes intercession. When I pray in other tongues, it is a language between me and God. It is my heavenly direct line to God. Are you with me so far? How do you get filled with the spirit? You just ask. That's all you do. A good father doesn't withhold gifts from his children. He says, hey, I'm not going to give you, uh, instead of bread, I'm gonna get, not going to give you a rock. Okay, that's in his word. Now follow me for a second. How do I get it, Pat? You just ask. What if I don't get it? So what? Can you mess it up? No. Can't mess it up. Why do I need it? Because you don't just need it to go to heaven. You need to go to the grocery store. Because we're living in a time where you better be able to pray in the spirit. It's, it induces you with power to make you a witness. It is the next level. It is an anointing from heaven. Well, how do I get it? Just ask. What if I don't get it? So what? Can you mess it up? No. How do I get it? You just ask. What's going to happen? There's a language that's going to begin to flow up out of you. And God's going to fill you with the Spirit. It's going to change your prayer language. So all over the place, raise both hands in the air. Why do you do that? Oh, I just do it because it's kind of a moment of surrender. That's it. Because we're about to pray for you all over this place. Pastor Steve, I believe God wants to undo them with the boldness that is on you. I believe God's going to do something. Now, those that are here, that, are, that all those hands that went up, they want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's about to happen. Because there's a bunch of hands that went up over here. Shake your hands at me again. If you say, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, shake them at me. Because I want to see them over here, right back there. Okay, because it's going to happen. All over here, okay, it's going to happen. God is going to fill you with the Spirit. Well, why do I want it, Pat? Because there's been moments in my life when my sister died, all I could do for one hour was pray in another tongue between heaven. It was God's healing balm. But there's also been times in my life where fear tried to overwhelm me, and all I could do was have my heavenly language begin to cry out to God. Listen, I have been in places of danger where all I could do was pray in the Spirit. One time, I was on a plane in Alaska, and my plane was about to go down. My son was 13 years old, and in his sleep, he began to pray out loud in other tongues. Karen ran into his room, woke him up at 1 in the morning and said, Nate, what's wrong with you? He said, oh, Mom, I was just asleep and I was just praying that Dad would be safe. I felt like Jesus needed to put his arms around him. But when he was praying in his sleep, it came out as another language. You still with me? Anybody jacked, jacked up about this? Because it's real deal stuff. You need it. You got to want it. You got to desire. You ready? Everyone in here, no one's going to, you're going to get filled. Everywhere we go, everybody gets filled. Okay? Because tongues... It's like buying a new pair of shoes when you get saved. Okay? It's like buying a new pair of shoes. Tongues come with it. Okay? It's part of salvation. It's a real deal. And it's incredible. And God wants to unwrap the gifts before you. You're his child. 
Everybody, lift your hands up before heaven and say, Father, I believe it's real. I desperately need it. I believe today you will baptize me in the Holy Spirit, a language between you and I. I submit my tongue to you. Forgive me if I've ever spoken things that is not according to your will. Purify my tongue. This day, I invite the Holy Spirit to invade my life in a new way, in a powerful way. Jesus, now get ready, because when, when, we, when we say Jesus the second time, when we say Jesus, fill me, you're going to begin to feel it. All right, you ready? Say, Jesus, I receive the gift of the Spirit, the language of heaven, in Jesus' name, baptize me now. Come on, begin to pray in the Holy Spirit all over here. Everyone, begin to pray in the Spirit. You've got to do it. It's a boldness. It's real. Pray in the Spirit. Nobody's got to rock you. Nobody's got to push you over. It's all real. All of you, go. Begin to lay hands on people now. Begin to pray over them right now. For about 10 seconds, go to the next one. Come on, begin to pray in the Spirit. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, pray. Pray. It's real. I'm not ashamed. Jordan, come walk with me. Cry out to him. Come on, cry out! Anointing of God, anointing of God, anointing of God. we got to break through. It's called the remnant. This is what it means to be remnant. This is what it means. Come on, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. We're pressing. Holy Spirit reign. It's getting thicker. It's getting thicker. 
Call, calling, calling of God. Calling of God. Calling of God. Calling of God. Calling. Okay, you ready? You ready? Here we go. It's another level, another level. Here it comes. Because Pastor Steve just taught us what marketplace anointing is about. It's about going in. It's about pastoring and loving people. Now follow me. I'm going to ask God to do something that's difficult. The word burden means, I believe I'm saying it correctly, and Pastor Mark would tell me, but, but the word burden is fortion in the Greek. I, I may be saying it wrong, but it means faults of the conscience which oppress the soul. And when a burden comes upon you, it is overwhelming. It's the reason why I wake up early in the morning, and there's even times that I'm going to sound weird to some of you, but I go to bed hearing the cries of the lost. It's been that way since I was 16 years old. The first night I had a dream of people being thrown into a pit, in a fiery pit. I had a dream. And it's heavy. So I don't want you to pray this unless you're real. But if you want to be remnant, it's got to be more than a popularity moment. It's got to be because you literally cannot stand the thought of somebody going to hell. There are times at night when I lay down in bed and I say, God, I need you to leave. Take my burden from me for a moment so I can sleep. I'm not, I'm just being, I don't ever tell anybody this, but my wife knows it. But, but one night he did that, and then I begged him, don't let it leave me again. There's a moment where we get out of the mirror and we look out the window for the fields that are white into harvest. So here's what we're going to do. Shut your eyes. I want you to pray this because this is what's going to compel you to be burdened or to be remnant. Pray this out, and I'm warning you, just for a second, just for one second, no music. Just pray this out loud because it's going to get very heavy because there is a moment where we've got to quit hiding in our houses we've got to go get the lost. The next level of this church, I believe this with all my heart from the Holy Spirit, is a harvest of the lost. I don't want recycled half-believers anymore. And church hoppers, where you flip the sheep over and they got 50 brands under them. There's a moment where we go after the lost. So pray this out loud. Say, God, I'm warning you, don't do it unless you're real. If you're not real, don't even bother doing this. If you're like, I don't even know what that means. Don't do it if you're not real. Say, God. God. If I'm, cruci- if I'm crucified with you, if, I'm crucified if I fellowship you, in your sufferings, if I bear one another's burdens, if Christ in me the hope of glory, then let me feel right now, because I fellowship in your sufferings, I bear one another's burdens, I'm warning you now, say let me feel what all my friends, family, Co-workers, co-workers, neighbors, neighbors classmates, classmates, all that are not saved. All that are not saved. Let, me feel their pain Let me feel their pain on this Saturday night, Saturday night. That, they are that they are feeling their lostness, their lostness. Right, now. right now. Now contend, travail. Cry out for the loss now, because that's remnant. Let it flow up. Tell the enemy to let go of your family. Say, God, anoint me 
fight for the truth. Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. We are contending. God will invade houses. He'll invade cars on the freeway. You have heard from the shepherd's heart tonight to rescue. Cry out. Okay, we're not there yet. Say it again. Say, God, let me feel what the lost in San Diego are feeling tonight. Let me have a burden. Let me feel what you felt for them on the cross. Now. Come on, that's a radical prayer, man. Go ahead, Pastor. Go ahead, Pastor. This is what it means to be remnant. To catch the burden. This is what it means to catch the burden. To catch a burden. I'm talking about an igniting for the lost. It must be about the lost. Jesus, Jesus. Igniting for the lost. Igniting for the lost. Igniting for the lost. Igniting for the lost. Igniting. Come on, begin to praise him across here. You got to call him in. Say, bring in the lost. Say, enemy, let go of my family. Come on, come on, break the confusion, break the confusion, break the confusion off their lives. I'm not ashamed, not ashamed. So I love what Pastor Steve said when he, the first thing he said was, God can do something with us. We're the remnant. We're either with him or we're against him. No more in-betweeners. And I love what he said, the remnant is true believers and not just agreeers. That's who we are. We're truly believers. Here's what I want you to do. See, I believe that the gift of prophecy begins to break out. I'm telling you, I was standing up here a moment ago, and the Lord said, I have already implanted in heart seeds throughout this service tonight for people that I'm actually calling to go to other nations. He says, I'm a, I'm a, there are students or children that are in this that will never forget this service because it will be the moment where they say, yeah, God, you can use me. But here's what I want you to understand. God is using the nobodies doesn't matter if you got a big spiritual uh, pedigree. doesn't matter if you come from some famous family. I don't. He is using simply one thing, the rags and the hand of God sent to clean up the messes. You know why I love Steve Smotherman? Because he's got no pedigree except for that of a king, the Savior. Now here's what I want you to do. Lift your hands and say, Lord, you're going to hear the voice of God. You ready? Say, God. Can you use me? Tell me what he said. What? What did he say? What did he say? What did he say? I didn't hear you. What did he say? It was instantaneous. God always gets the first word in before the enemy does when you ask him. God, can you use me? 
If you can use me, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll go global, God. That's the world in my backyard. I'll be global. I'll just be a global person. I'll be the world in my backyard. Or God, I'll go global. It doesn't matter. I am called to change the world. I am the remnant. I am the ones that will stand for truth. I am the ones that will rise up and lead. I don't give a rip what anybody thinks anymore. Now listen to me. Romans 15 verse 7 says, Except one another, just as Christ accepts you in order to bring praise to God. God is calling His people to come into alignment together in the power of agreement. I want you to take your hand. And you know what? I want to do something unless you're married. Guys with guys and girls with girls. And I don't normally say that, but I feel this. Because I feel like God's trying to bring covenant between people. The, a godly covenant between the people that will join together and begin to cry out together. So would you all over this area, and we're going to begin to walk through and lay hands on groups, but would you right now, guys with guys, girls with girls, unless you're married, begin to pray for each other now. Go, go, go. We've got to contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. Like Paul said, contend. Come on, cry out. Agree together. Come on. Anointing of God fall on this group right here. Anointing of God, anointing of God, right here. Anointing of God, fall. Come on, cry out. Cry out. Husband and wife, pray. This is a sending house. Anointing of God fall right here. Hey, call out of our sake.
I saw grass withering under your feet. And I saw an island surrounding you. Because the Lord has been trying to launch you too for a while. But it's not everybody else's plan for your life. God's <laughs> prophets 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 <laughs> I'm telling you, the Lord uses this church as a caravan. This church represents a semi of hope that pulls into places and brings it.
so holy. Oh, you're so holy. Set my feet on fire, Lord. <laughs> Come on, tell him that. Put the full armor on me, God. I will wear the belt buckle of truth that will keep me from becoming a streaker. To wear my pants for you, Lord. Lord, I will take up the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation. My feet will be fitted with readiness. Yeah. I will have the, bless, the breastplate of righteousness yeah. on me, God. Yeah. Lord, I will dress every day in your armor, not man's. Continually, oh God, anointed. Lift your hands before him and say, Lord, dress me in your armor. <laughs> the Lord, it will distinguish, you'll distinguish every arrow that comes my direction. Now listen to me. I believe what's going to begin to happen because those who stand for truth, you're going to get attacked. I mean, literally... I, I saw a Facebook message sent to me a moment ago and I sat down and I went and I just replied, I love you. Somebody. It's crazy. Because people love the old Pat, the youth convention speaker, the funny guy, the crazy guy. But this guy that's kind of making, that's just saying the way that it is. I, I got empowered tonight by Pastor Steve. You know why? Because here's a man in Albuquerque where roughly 11% claim to be saved. I, I guess I'm saying that number right. But he stood against homosexual marriage. All you got to do is anybody comes up to me and say, well, why is gay marriage wrong? Matthew 19. From foundation of the earth, man and woman. Why is gay marriage wrong? First commandment, go and populate. Can't do that. <laughs> but see, I've watched. You know what Pastor Steve does for me? He, he, he gives me permission. Because God is using that city or that church to rock that city and actually that region. How many of you are blessed tonight by the word that came forth? Wasn't it from God? Yeah, awesome. Did it just kind of meditate? You're just like going, yeah. Yeah, come on. You can do better than that. I honor him, and he's becoming fastly one of my dearest friends in the world because he just, you know what Steve taught me? Just say it. Just say it and don't care. And I love what he says. He said, I, I always answer my critics with one thing, the Word of God. Just answer with the Word of God. But tonight has been about empowering to take us deeper. It's been about us going into places where others won't go. What would happen if all of us, everybody in this room, I'm being honest, tomorrow morning you got up and you said, I'll bring three, I'm, I'm bringing four people with me. I'm going to bring four people. I bet if you'll pray before you go to bed who those four people are, God will invade their houses before you call them. I dare you to do that. I double dog dare you. I'll get southern on you. I triple dog dare you. Just to say, you know what? Yeah. Because remnant isn't about some really cool little sorority. It's not what it's about. I've had to fight almost to, to, to keep the definition pure because of young people and college students. I'm remnant. I'm remnant. Really? A remnant is about making a stand when others won't. And remnant is about actually believing in the gospel that, that, you, that, that you share it. Are you with me? I challenge you. I believe the next level of this property in this house is two things. I believe God's going to give you this building back. But I also believe that it's about the harvest of the lost. Are you with me? Sitting Christians hatch hypocrites. And there is a moment where you rise up and you say, I am going after the lost. And if you're not going after the lost, you really don't believe in the message. Because the message was never about the mirror. He said, look to the fields. for the, They are white in the harvest. He said, plenty of folks, just not a lot of workers. You know what the remnant is? It's the ones that don't complain. They just go. It's the ones that show up early and leave late. It's the ones that say, I am in this thing. And it's easy to scream your remnant till you have to your forced by the Holy Spirit to make a stand. I'm telling you, trust me. But I believe this is one of the houses that God has caused to rise up, to change. Not just Southern California, but I believe there's an anointing at abiding place to say, let's do this. You do know the writing that your pastor did on alcohol. 
I've shared, and it's been shared hundreds upon hundreds of times, because people knew what they should believe. They just didn't know how to read it or say it. And so the scientists stepped up. Listen, this house is apologetically anointed. I believe that. To stand up and tell the truth. Are you, are you inspired tonight, ignited by the glory? Amen. Let's go get the lost. If you, didn't, if you walk away from anything, it was simply this. A UPS driver decided to pastor his route in the place he was working. God calls him into ministry. Unorthodox, like all the others. They kind of went up and worked their way up the ladder, and God raised him up in both places he went. He raised up powerful houses and now one of the largest churches in America. Why? Because he says, I'm not bowing. And you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. We have tiptoed around for so long thinking we're going to offend people. You're actually offending them by not telling them the truth. Let's quit treating people stupid. Let's let people realize it's the compassion crisis. I'm writing a chapter in my new book called The Compassion Crisis because the compassion crisis is we love people's flesh more than we love their soul, and that actually means we don't love them. We must tell them the truth in a loving way. I love what Pastor Steve said. He said, remnant is about compassion and love, but it's about the truth as well. Amen? Let's give the Lord a praise. Pastor? Come on! We cry, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord. We cry, holy is the Lord. Let your light now shine, shine through me. Let your light now shine, shine through me. The harvest time is here. Let your light now shine. Let your light now shine. Shine, Lord, through me. Harvest time is here. Let your light now shine. Shine your light through me. Let your light now shine. Cause harvest time is here. Okay, 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 okay. What's your name? Katrina, Katrina is scared right now, but I'm going to ask her to share something with you because I think you're supposed to seal the deal. Okay? You ready, Evangelist? All right. Okay. All right. Uh, just tell them exactly what you told me, and then we're going to do the four people. Okay? Is that my question? Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Okay, so <laughs> before he even said anything about um, inviting people, four people, um, Early on in the service, before Pastor Steve came up here, God just showed me a vision that um, every single person in this place was going to be called to the front and have to write down four people, one, two, three, four, people that you are committing tonight to call, text, whatever you have to do to get them here tomorrow, whether it's morning service or evening. But... I mean, it was clear as day, when I have these visions, I see people just, they go up and they walk to the front. It's just literally happening before my eyes. And so I truly believe that God is calling every single person in this place, no one excluded, okay? On, because preach. each of us know different people, obviously. And there's a reason that you're here tonight, because you know four people different from the person and, next and to I you. And I said four people, right? Before. He said four people, and I just couldn't help myself. I'm... I'm sorry. So just start thinking right now. Maybe we don't have pens and paper to hand out. No, but we can do this. You ready? Okay. Okay, you ready? I'm going to hold up a finger, and I want you to call out a name. God will speak to you right now. I'm going to go all the way to four, okay? Four people you know. Because when she came, it's, what, what's your name again? Katrina. Katrina. 
Okay, yeah, okay, I knew that. Okay. She walked up to me and she said, Wow, what you just said that God showed me for service. Okay, I believe in I believe in the prophetic visions of the Lord. And I also believe in confirmation, the power of two. You ready? When I hold up one finger, I just want you to scream out a name. And God's gonna let you remember four names that we're gonna get here tomorrow. You ready? And I'm not I've never done this before in my life. This wasn't planned, it wasn't staged, none of that weird stuff. You ready? What we're gonna I'm gonna call out one and you know who they are. I'm gonna call out one, I'm gonna raise up one finger and you say out their name and we're gonna remember the four at the end. Ready? Number one, call the name out. Mark Hodges. Okay. Number two, call the name out. Kim Davy. Now think about it because some of you go, I only have two friends. No, you have more than that. Listen, I promise you do. You have more than that. You ready? Number three, call the name out. Deborah Latour. Ready? Okay. And now, and now, and I honestly believe the last one is someone that may have walked away that needs an encounter with God that's been wounded and uh, maybe offended at some things or whatever it is but if you'll call them god will melt their heart when you call their name out he'll melt their heart while they're sleeping i believe that with all my heart because i've seen it happen over and over anybody lays on my heart i have a rule if somebody lay god lays somebody in my heart i text them right then it, the best i can and uh uh because i just man i just want to say i love you whatever it is that's the lord many times i don't ever want to miss it so i'm going to call out the fourth one and it's god's going to speak somebody to you right now ready number four now raise your hands and say, in Jesus' name, we call them in. in Jesus name. And Lord, I will do my part to get them here. In Jesus' name. I'm going to do it again one more time. Number one, call their name out. Number two. Number three. Number four. Give God a shout across here. Go ahead, man. Find a bunch of people around you, hug them, tell them that you love them. Remind them they got four people they got to get after in the next few hours because Sunday morning is coming quick.